so welcome to the first uh, technical session of the conference. I just want to say there is a small typo in the program. So this session is from 10.30 to 12.10, not to 12, but lunch is only at 12.10, so I hope it's okay. And the first speaker is uh, Stefan Tilkov, who's going to talk about microservices, a taxonomy. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be able to talk to you. Um, I would like to present on a topic that's dear to my heart, which is the various kinds of microservices that I've observed or that we've observed in the wild. So as with any hype, and microservices is a hype, and unless you haven't noticed by now, um, as with any hype, um, it's interesting to see how many people attach their own ideas to the label, right? You see somebody who has been doing whatever it is for a decade, and now suddenly it becomes this new thing because it's at the moment very convenient to associate it with that particular label. And I see that happening with a lot of things. And as usual with any hype, uh, it leads to uh, quite a bit of confusion where people criticize what, people, what other people are doing um, because they know they're doing microservices, but they may assume something completely different from what it actually is that they're doing. So that's why I wanted to talk a bit about the various ways and the various kinds we see out there. So let me start first by talking a little bit about what I think everybody can agree upon is the set of common traits that all the variants of microservices share. So I've picked my favorite ones. You might disagree slightly on the priority, but my assumption is that most of you will sort of agree with those somewhat vague assertions about what microservices are about. To me, the isolated deployment thing is a very key thing. Most people share that assumption, but it's not absolutely 100% necessary for all the definitions. But in general, these things are uh, what, what people agree on. So what are some of the differences? There are tons of differences in terms of the technology being used, about implementation restrictions, about the process being used to develop those things, about the, um, the, the separation of concerns. But to me, the most important thing in categorizing uh, microservices is their size. And that, in fact, has been true for decades for basically any new mod modularization technique, right? It was objects and components, and libraries and shared libs and and uh, services in the SOA, whatever, tons of different ways, but all it's always the size that matters a lot in this context. Because uh, the size of the individual microservice determines the number of microservices, obviously, that make up a whole system. And it also de very strongly determines the interconnection between those things. And if you think of the classical definition of architecture, that actually is the definition of architecture, right? The components and the connections and the, and the, relation and the rules that govern their relationships. So size is the thing I'm going to focus on. And I've, I've decided to do that starting from examples. So I'll always present an example first, and then I'll sort of reverse engineer a pattern or, t or a taxonomy entry from that. So the first one is, um, let's assume your task is to implement an IoT platform. It's a very cool thing these days. We have something that consumes tons of events. Um, those events um, are generated by sensors, by uh, devices out in the field, and you need to process those events um, very quickly, and you want to separate the, the pr processing of those events into individual, uh, into, into individual small parts. Each of those parts might be as small as a single function that maybe converts from, well, from one coordinate system to another, or that maybe converts a temperature from one scale to another, or aggregates a few values, or computes an average, or whatever. Tons of little tiny things, tiny functions that really do just one thing. To me, this is actually probably the only thing that really merits the name microservices, because these things are micro, uh, super, super small. They may be five lines or ten lines, or as I like to say, 100 lines if you're using Java, but they're really still very, very small, right? So very small things. I like, because, because they're so focused, I like to call these uh, things, not only me, but people have started to call this function as a service, right? This is just um, as small as you can get them. And then a function as a service architecture, which you can observe these days in many of the, many of the modern cloud platforms, um, these are the, the, the traits that really um, that are, are exposed by most of these systems. They're, these things are typically triggered by events, right? So something occurs, like, a, like an incoming entry from some device, or maybe a file uploaded, or maybe uh, a message received, um, or a threshold um, exceeded, something like that, threshold crossed, something like that will lead to, uh, to some function firing off. So typically communication is async. 
If you want to look for examples, one, one person I can very strongly recommend is Fred George. If you look for Fred George's talks, there are a number of them available online. Um, he, I think, was the first one to talk about this type of thing very, very early on, almost, a, I don't know, maybe a decade ago. Uh, obviously, this is what serverless architecture is about, and this slide only has AWS Lambda, but you can uh, also assume that Google Functions, Azure fu Google Cloud Functions and Azure Functions, sort of the same model apply to this thing. Now, in a function as a service architecture, there are some consequences. The most important one to me is that you have this shared infrastructure dependency, because a lot of your application actually is not within your code. A lot of your application is in the configuration of the infrastructure. Where you have you registered your event handlers? How have you configured the routing between them? What are the, what are the, the things that you have deployed? Where it's really more about the configuration and the stuff that you, that you do on that level that actually determines what the whole thing does. You may have common interfaces, the same type of message sent to multiple event handlers, um, event ap application logic and configuration, as I mentioned. And this might lead, that is my suspicion at least, to something that if you want to label it with a, in a positive way, you'd call emerging behavior. If you want to label it negatively, you say, what the hell just happened? Because trying to make sense of what happened in a system like that can be a tough call, right? can be pretty tough to find out why something happened, because all of the timing issues and all of the complexity in the configuration so I am a little skeptical, but we'll see. It's definitely a very interesting thing. From a commercial standpoint, it's, it's really, really cool that this can be built per request. Right? So you really only pay for what you use. You don't have to provision anything up front. You typically have a free tier, um, which is really, really cool. What might not be so cool is that you might have some unpredictability in the whole thing, because there's no guarantees at the moment as to how long it'll take to fire up something that can actually run your function and you might run into problems because of that. So that's my first entry into the taxonomy. Um, the very, very super sm very small, super micro or nano or function style services that run on top of some powerful platform. The second entry, I'll get again, I'll start with an example. This is probably the more well-known or the most well-known a variant of the whole thing. Let's say you have a number of services that collaborate or are used in collaboration to produce a product detail page. That's the kind of page you'd look at if you look at a product in an e-commerce site. right? So you have those services that take care of certain aspects of the whole thing, and then you have some services that call those services, which might in turn call more services, and you have this wonderful term orchestration, which I have now probably been hating for a decade or two. So orchestration in the end will, will assemble the result of all of those services and produce a final page, right? And in that final page, or be used to produce a final page, in that final page, you'll see things retrieved from all of those services. And typically, the, the, the style here is that it's a, it's a pull-driven style. So a request comes in down here. For some reason, my UI is at the bottom. I don't know why. So the, there's a request coming in at the bottom. And then it, it, gets, it gets turned into a number of requests to the, to the, to the leaf services, which then uh, bring back their results. It gets aggregated, and finally the, finally the page is produced. As, I'm, as, I'm, uh, as, I've, as I've seen more than one hype, this reminds me of another one, which, which was called SOA, Service Oriented Architecture. So I like to call this micro SOA because it's very, very similar. Right? It's eerily similar in the whole concept. There are some differences. I'm not going to go into them. But in general, if from an architecture perspective, it's, it's quite similar to what most people did there. These services are still small, and they're also still self-hosted. They're they're lightweight, right? This is the type of thing that you would dockerize and containerize because that's what you do to everything these days. So it's a small application bundled, wrapped in a container so that it runs in their own, in its own process, can have its own operating system distribution, or just what it needs, maybe a collaboration of a number of, of little processes that actually collaborate to produce this thing. The key thing here is that those, at least in this, in this simplified way that I'm presenting them here. In this architecture, those services communicate in a synchronous fashion. So one service will call another service, which will call, call another service, right? So that's the, the collaboration aspect here. This is fantastically popular, mostly because Netflix did such a fantastic job of talking about it, which is cool. I love Netflix. It's a fantastic company. I always like to say I'm a very satisfied customer. Um, I, I use their services all the time. I also find them extremely impressive from a technical standpoint. I also think they're a really, really bad role model for most organizations we work with, right? Because most of the organizations we work with are not in the business of providing video streaming to a few hundred million people. If that is the business you're in, by all means, this is a fantastic architecture. If it's not, maybe not. Because there are some consequences to this model, right? It's, 
the services here are really collaborating for a common goal. It's really, it really very much is one system where its small parts are, are taken apart for a certain reason, the most important reason being scalability, runtime scalability, right? So we want to tear them apart so that we can fire up 100 instances of that and 50 instances of that and then distribute the load across them dynamically. One of the downsides is that all of this distribution across all of these small things requires a lot of effort to make things work. Because calling something that calls something that calls something that calls something is a sure recipe for disaster. So what you have to do is make sure that you can still continue if something doesn't answer in time. So you have timeouts, resilience patterns, lots of things that take care of that, which is a pretty tough thing. So there's a high cost of coordination, high infrastructure demand. Um, you have all of these streaming issues, all of those things. So typically, it is something that you'd use in an environment with a lot of uh, scalability requirements, right? Where that is the most important concern, not the complexity of your system. Now, I'll do a one-minute detour throughout my favorite anti-pattern because I need it for my next taxonomy entry. This is something that we observe in lots of projects. People cut things apart because that's the cool thing to do, right? Once you have a whole number of small little services, everything is going to be all right. Unfortunately, what you find out is that you have these <sighs> annoying factors called humans and stakeholders, right, that actually want something from you. So you might have a stakeholder who's interested in a specific part of the system, which now covers a number of services. And you have another stakeholder who has a similar interest, but with some overlap. And you have a third one, and you can probably guess what's going to happen next. The problem here is that while you have separated things into smaller parts, you haven't taken the stakeholder relationship into account. You haven't made sure that your stakeholders don't overlap, which is typically what most people want to do when they, when they adopt a microservices architecture. Typically, they're not as much concerned with the runtime scalability, they're more concerned with development time scalability. You want to be able to move a team forward quickly. You don't want to have meetings to synchronize what the requirement is with somebody else. So this is not going to help you. What you would want, again, I don't have the time to go into more detail, is something more like this, where you have autonomous cells, autonomous units, organizational units that actually own a part of a system um, so that it has very, very little overlap, right? That is the goal that you typically want to pursue. For that goal, the small, these small variants don't really help you, which is why we see two other characteristical things that I'm going to talk about next. The first one is this. Imagine this is a logistics application. You have a complex business case. There's lots of business logic implemented in some high-level language. And you separate the, the pretty com complex domain into smaller subdomains or contexts. And then you have each of them take care of its own things, mostly on its own. So the goal here would be for those things at the top to be able to fulfill incoming requests on their own without having to rely on others, without having these distributed call chain problems. If this reminds you of something called domain-driven design or DDD, then you're right. That was the goal, right? This, this is a very similar approach. We have those contexts. They have, a, they have a certain environment. They share some things with others. There's some overlap in terminology, maybe even some overlap in data, which is why we have this event synchronization thing on top. What we end up with is something we'd like to call, we like to call distributed DDD, right? It's the DDD concept, which you can apply in a single monolithic application, but applied to form a a distributed environment where each of those services is now a lot bigger than in the in the last model. We still have a front end application that uses that stuff, so that hasn't changed that much. But again, we've we've grown a bit bigger, right? We may still be containerized, but we now have this unit of logic and data and responsibility for a certain aspect, for a certain context of the whole thing. I don't have any examples that are as famous as the ones that I've talked about le uh, on the last slide. It doesn't really matter. There are uh, tons of companies who do this. It's a very popular approach. Now, all these loose coupling, something that you want to have, um, leads to um, a possibility of separate evolution of the context, right? So you can have different release cycles and meaningful release cycles. It's not just one specific tiny part that you can't release on its own because it doesn't, have, doesn't make any sense. It's rather a slightly bigger thing that on its own provides value to you, to the end users or to the callers, let's say. Um, the asynchronicity between these things uh, improves stability. You now don't have to have everything running at the same time to get a, to get a meaningful, successful call. So... Um, it's uh, it's uh, a little more stable. It's also very well suited for parallel development, right? That is that is a key thing here. Now, you may have you may have noticed that I like this a little better than the than the than the last um, uh, thing. 
again, I'm, I'm, I really want to point out that it all depends on the circumstances and the requirements and the context you're, uh, you're working in, right? So for example, the, one, the, the thing that I just showed you is a perfect match for a lot of environments. It, is, uh, it suffers, or it has, it exposes one aspect, which is this single front-end thing. And if that is okay with you, then everything is fine. Sometimes that is sadly a misconception, right? Som sometimes people think it's okay, but it's not. Because in this whole architecture world, people tend to think that that UI thing is the easy part, right? So we talk about microservices, about the backend things, and HTTP, JSON, RESTful, whatever interfaces. Who cares? At the end, we maybe should care about what gets delivered to the actual end users who typically pay for our bills. So the assumption many backend architects have is that once you have those services, everything's going to be easy. You just have to sprinkle this tiny little bit of UI on top, and then everybody's going to be happy. While in reality, it looks more like this. Right, you have this big monolithic thing. Now, if that is what you end up with, you've made everything worse, right? You've you had a monolith, and now you still have a monolith. Plus, you have a hundred small services that you have to maintain and operate. That is not a positive development, right? So, if you if you suffer from a from a uh, front end monolith disease, then you should address that and not ignore it and try to you know do something else. Which brings me to my last one, next to last taxonomy entry, um, again illustrated uh, with an example. Now, this is an e-commerce site. Imagine a large storefront like, for example, Amazon or a similar retailer where um, there are pretty distinct parts of the site. If you navigate through the site, at one point in time, you're actually looking at the catalog, researching products, comparing things, and then you're actually putting stuff into your, into your uh, um, uh, uh, shopping cart, and then you check out, and then you pay for those things, and then maybe you check what's what the status of your orders is. These are all pretty distinct things. So you can imagine that all of those things could be built as an end-to-end -end application of its own. Now, it's an interesting question whether that can still be called a service, right? And in some sense, it can, right? It provides a service. It now provides a service to the end user, right? Because it includes its own UI. That, I think, is the key point here. It's a little, it's maybe as big or a little bigger than the one we had on the last slide in the, DD, in the DDDD model, but it now has this end-to-end -end responsibility. And the connections between those things happens at the front end which, again, is something very different from the others. It's now a meaningful part of architecture to think about how to integrate front-end parts using links and redirects and other means that I don't have the time to go into detail about right now. We like to call this SCS for self-contained systems to make the difference of, you know, it's not really services, it's, it's systems, and they're not really micro, so we can't really call them micro. Uh, we s we've seen this stuff uh, many times. Um, uh, please ignore the last bullet point here. We've seen this many times. Um, there are a number of companies, they don't talk about, they don't use this label, and they probably would refuse to, to uh, be used as an example for that, especially Amazon. But Groupon, and, uh, or at least Otto, and some others of the ones listed at scsarchitecture.org, which is a site just describing this pattern, are very happily talking about the whole thing. So some of the consequences, larger systems still, right? So we've slowly grown in size from the first entry to this entry. We're now able to autonomously serve requests front end to back end, right? End to end responsibility. Uh, typically, no extra infrastructure because this is just a web app. And again, well suited if, the, if your goal is the decoupling of teams. Now, as with any of those things, I've, I've made deliberate, a deliberate choice to simplify things drastically, right? There are lots of gray areas between those things. So obviously, you can have more asynchronicity or synchronicity in each of those things. That you, can, you can have them smaller and larger and more independent and re redundant data or not. But these are sort of the general patterns that we see. Another thing that we've seen is that things don't have to be a, uh, a mutually exclusive choice. So if you think about uh, building blocks and, and composition in general, it's very, very common that a, a building block will be decomposed into more building blocks, which in turn can each be decomposed into more building blocks. So one approach we've seen and applied in a number of projects now is that we start from a top down, which sounds risky, but you know, very carefully and only very for a very limited amount of time, try with a top down approach to find the larger units, and then for each of those units, make a decision on how to proceed. Because one of them may have super crazy scalability requirements. Another one may be the perfect use case for an awesome IoT function as a service platform. And the third one may best be built as a boring web app. Right? So there's no reason to assume that once your context becomes big enough that everything needs to be solved with the same method. So you can apply the same pattern. The general idea of having local locality of decision can be applied on this architecture level too. <coughs> 
Which leads me to sort of my final entry, which in fact is something I've talked about before, which is the, uh, the basic idea that uh, sometimes this thing is what you want to have. Now, this is pretty dark. I don't know whether you can see it. But that is actually a monolith. Right, so maybe sometimes you want to build a monolith because that is the most appropriate decision for your particular task at hand. In fact, I would argue that monoliths are a great solution unless they are too big. And the problem is that it's pretty hard to start developing them and then change your mind later that, they, yeah, that was too big, let's just quickly change it. That's not something you can easily do, right? So f putting that, putting that, 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 um, that gauge at the right position or that... that, that, that um, Regulator to the right position is pr a pretty tough thing. What's the right size? Does it have to be? Uh, is it too small? Is it too big? How, what can we handle? In fact, this is probably the the oldest question or the oldest design and architectural task that we had. Right? We separate separate things and we join things that belong together. Right? That's that's what we want to do. Now, I have a I have a ton of slides and I could talk for hours about the connection of this to organization and processes and humans, but I won't because that's all the time I have. Thanks. So, <laughs> any questions or comments on that part? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a very nice uh, presentation. I thank like you. I learned a lot from this, uh, and I also agree, agree with you that uh, it is uh, really the devo is in the details. So, for example, when you say about the UI part. It is ac actually quite um, tr tricky, right? Mm -hmm. When you say, and uh, I, uh, if you say like uh, the monolith um, uh, kind of uh, front end uh, UI, uh, you want to you say that you can do that. You uh, mentioned that we can uh, break it down like in terms mm -hmm. of microservices. They have to control their own UI. Is, is that what you, yes. uh, you suggest? Yes. Yes. So my my suggestion would be, if you can, then apply the same principles that you apply to the back end to the front end as well, because in the end, the back end front end separation is a very artificial one. Right? No user pays you for separating back end and front end. No user even knows what you're talking about. So from an end user perspective, you only care about the functionality that you delivered through the actual UI. So that should definitely be part of your strategy. Now it's not easy at all, if you have restrictions that force you to build a front-end monolith. There you have a restriction that says you can only deliver uh, um, a mobile app every two weeks or every month or every six months. Then obviously that is a monolith, right? That is a deployment monolith. It's the, it's the definition of the whole thing. It's much easier if you're in a web context because with a web application, you have great means of separating things into separate parts. I'm a big fan of the web, so I'm, I always get enthusiastic about that. Think about, for example, the way um, uh, big sites like, for example, Amazon present themselves to the end user, right? You look at one part of the site and then you click on something and if you, if you, if you squint and look really closely, you can see that this is not exactly the same thing. It's, it's almost the same, but not really because you're es essentially talking to two, two, two different applications that feel as if they're part of a whole, which is something I, I like a lot. I mean, like, uh, but I mean, if you say about the MVC um, application, right? Yeah, I, I, yes, I, I much prefer, yes. It's a short version, I much prefer server-side rendered MVC applications to client-side single-page, monolithic single-page apps, but there's a middle ground there as well. Yeah. So, okay, okay. but we can, we can go into more detail later. So, uh, Over there. One more quick question. So thank you for the presentation. Apparently I've been doing a lot of SES, I just discovered. Oh, um, cool. So when, when you separate uh, these front end, right? And now you have the for each system, self contained system, you have mm -hmm. a separate front end team, R right? Uh, my experience with that is that if, if you don't control it somehow, it will end up having a lot of happy front end people all doing uh, different things uh, that mm -hmm. are not coherent with each other, right? right? So, do you think we should give up? Do you think we should coordinate them? Uh, how does that, the, uh, that the cope with the independent nature of microservice right. development? So, that I think is a, is a fantastic question, a very relevant question, because um, it's not, it not not only applies to the front end part, right? In general, what you what you aim for is autonomy and independence and localization of decisions. Tho those are all awesome things until you notice that everybody's doing things th for the third or fourth time without any point being to it, right? So you have to you have to find a good balance. What I like to what I like to use as a as a as a model as a vision is the idea of a regulated market. Let's imagine you're in a you're in a uh, you're in a weekly market where you buy your groceries, right? Your vegetables and stuff. Then if you look at that thing, it is very tightly regulated. You can't just go there and do what you like. You have a very small spot in which you can do something. But 
what you do within that spot is your thing, right? Whether you sell cucumber or tomato this week, it's completely your thing. If somebody else wants to do something, it's fine as well. So there needs to be a lot of autonomy within the small things, but there need to be ways for people to go through the aisles, and there needs to be some regulation how to get to the water and to the electrical power or whatever, right? It's a it's sort of a balance that has grown over a number of years, and I think we need to strive for the same thing. So in your specific example for the front end part, I would say that there is something that I want to have consistent across the organization, like a corporate design, maybe a style guide, maybe reusable components. That's a little tight here, but still, I think that's a good idea. Have reusable components, but never don't force them onto people. Offer them to people, right? Look, this is the catalog of 50 components that we have that you can use. Pick the version you want to use, and then use them, and occasionally, please upgrade so that you get the newest, nicest design. So in return, Maybe the maybe the two different UIs will not look exactly the same, but they'll feel the same, which would be fine with me. Okay, I think we I think we need to stop with the questions. Um, thanks again, and have a good rest of the conference. Thank you.